Well, good morning, everybody. This week, uh, Dr. Perry Class, the New York Times wrote a wonderful article um, highlighting the work of the American Pediatric Surgical Association around an article that was published in the Journal of the American Medical Association Surgery about pain management and opioids in, uh, in, in infants and children, especially adolescents. And I thought it would be great if we could get together to look at the uh, importance of that article and how uh, significant it might be to our, our practice and especially uh, for the pediatric surgeons in APSA um, as, they, um, as they take on these challenges, especially with pain management. So why don't we introduce ourselves first and uh, then um, we can go over some of the areas of the article. Hello, my name is Andrea Hayes Jordan and I am the Surgeon in Chief of the University of North Carolina Children's Hospital and the Division Chief for UNC School of Medicine Division of Pediatric Surgery. Hi, I'm Barb Gaines. I'm the Associate Surgeon in Chief at the Children's Hospital of Pittsburgh and I'm the former trauma director here. Good morning. I'm Ellen Reynolds. I'm the medical director of uh, pediatric surgery at St. Luke's Children's Hospital in Boise, Idaho. Good morning, afternoon, or evening, wherever you're watching. I'm Dave Powell. I'm a clinical professor of surgery at Stanford University and Lucille Packard Children's Hospital. And I'm Tom Tracy. I'm a pediatric surgeon and I'm currently the executive director of the American Pediatric Surgical Association. So thanks uh, everybody for getting together. Um, Ellen, I wanted to ask you first that um, the New York Times article that came out uh, that spoke about APSA and its work really highlighted the foundations of what we've come to know as uh, opioid stewardship. And I, I wanted to get your impression about how significant are these findings uh, and how important is this APSA committee work that uh, resulted uh, uh, from a lot of their extensive work to analyze all of the literature around pain management? Yes, well, this is really an extraordinary review. Over 14,000 articles were included for review and over 200 were chosen for systematic analysis. And these are the first guidelines that have ever been published for the management of pain in children undergoing surgery. So we've never really had anything uh, written to help guide us uh, over the years as we do extensive surgery on children. So Dr. Gaines and Dr. Hayes Jordan, given the real complexity of pain management, you know, it's really individualized for each patient. I wonder, are there any lessons that from this study that you guys could apply to the more complicated pain, man pain management issues in patients with cancer or multi-system trauma? Dr. Hayes Jordan? Yes, absolutely, Dave. Um, this is a very outstanding paper really highlighting what we can do as pediatric surgeons and opioid stewardship. And when it comes specifically to pediatric cancer management, these patients, of course, have, are undergoing sometimes a year or two years of treatment. And so any chronic use of opioids is gonna be even more magnified in this patient population. So it's even more important for us to be uh, stewards of opioids and limit their use. I think one of the suggestions they had in the article is one that we can really use in pediatric cancer is utilizing intravenous acetaminophen as a standard post-operative treatment to avoid opioid use. And this provides a real baseline of pain management that in my experience has resulted in being able to reduce, if not eliminate the use of opioids post-operatively in pediatric cancer patients. So the use of intravenous Tylenol as well as Ketorolac, um, are, there are some of the suggestions from the article, and those can be quite effective in pediatric cancer uh, pain management. Dr. Gaines, what about the trauma patient? I think what makes the trauma patient unique is that they have oftentimes multiple areas that are injured, and each of those have their own set of potential um, complications in terms of medications that we use. For example, the child with a traumatic brain injury may not be a candidate for a non-steroidal because of their increased bleeding risk. Or there has been in the past concern regarding fracture healing when using non-steroidals. And so I think the first thing that this paper really did is it said, hey, pain management is as important as any other aspect of our care of the patient and deserves the same critical appraisal and um, a really a well thought out plan of how to manage a child's pain. 
And it also highlights that multimodal therapy can be really helpful. So using multiple different medications that have different mechanisms of action can really help our patients. And that not all pain needs to be managed even with a medication at all and really involving things like our child life specialists to help with um, children manage their discomfort, distraction therapy, some of the other non-pharmacologic sources of pain. So I think that the, what makes the trauma patient complicated is that there's lots of different cooks in the kitchen, lots of different, um, as I like to say, body part doctors who um, have concerns about their particular organ system, but gathering those people together and coming up with a comprehensive pain management plan, I think is really important. Great. Um, Ellen, the, the uh, New York Times article by uh, Dr. Klass pointed out um, some real concerns about the focus that this paper brought on, on opioid use disorder. So that could direct clinicians with that focus away from adequate treatment of post-operative pain. Uh, and I know in your practice in, in the community, you see uh, a lot of, a lot of uh, what parents' concerns are as well as the patients for adequate pain management. Do you, do you see that this paper from JAMA Surgery um, had, had any dangerous elements that would direct uh, surgeons away from giving a, appropriate pain management? No, I don't think that there is an actual danger uh, for undertreating children's pain, but I do think there is a perceived danger. I think that parents, of course, understandably, are very concerned about the pain that their child uh, might have. I do the pectus excavatum surgeries, and that is one of the most painful procedures I think a child can undergo. And parents are very concerned about how we are going to manage their pain. And if they hear that, oh, we're just going to use Tylenol and ibuprofen, um, that, that their they don't want to have the surgery and that their child may be in excruciating pain. And I think that the key to all of this is education. Um, education both for our families explaining to them all the different types of pain medication that we are going to use, and education for the physicians and the whole healthcare team that uh, other modalities can be very effective, but that it's okay to use narcotics on a very short-term basis and to make sure that the families understand what the risks are, uh, how to dispose of the medication. I think we can dispel a lot of these myths and it all just comes down to taking the time to talking with our families and educating ourselves as to what the best course of action is. Well, Andrew, do you have any ideas about that education? I mean, you do a lot of complex surgery, both for cancer as well as other conditions. What, what about that and, and the dangers that, uh, that this article tried to bring up and, and what, are, what are the concerns that you have? I would agree with Ellen that the dangers can be overcome by education. I think that the parents uh, can be explained to them what the importance is of avoiding opioids. And in the cancer population, the parents are extremely engaged, uh, perhaps a little bit more than in other disease processes in the child's well-being and very focused on the quality of life because unfortunately in some cancers, um, the, there is a short-lived uh, period where they're undergoing treatment. And so their focus on quality of life is one that they should have, but we can educate them in emphasizing that that quality of life can be maintained even with non-opioid treatment of their post-operative pain. So again, I don't think there's a danger. I think it just something that we need to spend time educating our parents on and also educating the nursing staff so that they, when they are in a position of offering a PRN pain medication, for example, that they understand uh, which options would be better for that patient and being able to adequately explain it to the parents so the parents don't feel that their child is going to be experiencing any pain. Well, we all, we all go ahead, Barb. Oh, I was going to add that I think that um, in some cases, the parents are actually have these concerns and they are quite hesitant to accept um, opioid pain medications, even in the case of a child who really is in significant pain. So I think that the education and the conversations need to go both ways. And I think it's all about communicating appropriate expectations to parents and to children, particularly the teenagers, of what to expect and how we are going to be treating their pain 
but we're going to be using different kinds of medications and combinations of medications to more effectively treat their pain. Um, and I think that that's really where that education and it all boils down as so many of the issues that we have to really effectively communicating with the families and making sure that everyone's expectations are aligned. I think that's a great segue into what is our final question. We've just talked about parent and patient education, but we also know that there's actually a several stage process to get physician practice changed. Pediatric surgeons for so long have been so uh, involved in keeping their patients from having pain. I wonder if any of you see foresee any uh, obstacles in changing that paradigm that surgeons have into how they're gonna manage pain postoperatively. Ellen, why don't we start with you? You know, I think the only obstacles will be the ones that we make ourselves. So as if we surgeons recognize that uh, we need to be good stewardships of opioids, uh, it's not just a great technical surgery, it's the entire recovery process that we should be managing for our children. So if we take it on ourselves to develop pain management protocols that include all members of our team, the nurses, the advanced pair, uh, practice providers, uh, and everyone is taught this protocol and we are very consistent in our message to the families, no matter who the family calls and talks to, we all provide the same answer, then I think that will overcome a lot of difficulties in terms of implementing uh, these new ideas. Dr. Hayes Jordan, how do you see changing the physician's plan, the physician's practice of this and any obstacles to doing that? I think, I think again, Ellen is correct. Uh, overcoming these obstacles are going to be, it's going to be important to communicate with all the physicians involved and not just the surgeons, but for example, our partners in primary care and pediatrics, uh, and in my case, mainly the pediatric oncologist, but involving more physicians in the education process is going to help emphasize uh, to the patient um, how important it is. And it is going to be sort of challenging for, it could perhaps be challenging for some uh, providers who are more senior in their practice and have used opioids for a long time. And that may be a, a barrier to overcome. But again, I think it can be overcome with uh, more education to the multidisciplinary care that needs to occur with a child. Dr. Gaines, what do you see as the issues to try and get you and your partners to change to this new paradigm? I think that mostly it's um, making sure that everyone has the same level of expectations, um, providing education, um, and also in for trauma in particular, making sure that our multidisciplinary colleagues are on board as well, sharing new evidence. For example, there are um, now guidelines from the Orthopedic Trauma Associations regarding the use of NSAIDs and fracture healing and that the acute use does not impact fracture healing and making sure that those best practice guidelines are broadly disseminated amongst our colleagues um, from the neurosurgical population, um, really looking again at the actual risk of non-steroidals, how long that risk lasts. Um, and I think that will be important I think this is an area where care pathways or power plans or whatever your particular electronic medical record is using can be very helpful to provide um, similar guidelines for similar types of procedures. And I think that would be um, quite helpful. Well, one of the things that I want to do is I want to be able to thank um, uh, the Outcomes Committee from the American Pediatric Surgical Association. As Ellen pointed out at the beginning, this review was massive. Uh, and I think that just by the conversation we've had today, it's uh, stimulated an awful lot of thought. Um, and I think um, uh, hopefully a lot of uh, impetus to uh, implement a lot of the concern, or implement a lot of the suggestions they had and, and also to clarify some of the concerns uh, that they had as well as uh, Dr. Klass did in her New York Times article. So really appreciate you all taking time out this morning for this important discussion.